Good evening. Thanks for having me. Everybody that's responsible for setting this up, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the problem of evil, and uh, I call it the problem of saying evil, and that's not to be honorary toward those that don't share my particular beliefs. That's because through the study of logic and through the study of philosophy, as I intend to show tonight, that the philosophical problem of evil is an incoherent concept, and therefore the the Christian view, though it has a lot to show beyond that, uh, has to start there. And basically, it, it's not something that starts in academic halls. It's a persistent question. It's basically the question that if a good God made the world, then why is it the way that it is? That's the nagging objection at the heart of most other modern doubts, the so-called problem of evil, probably the most ingrained objection against the Christian faith. In fact, if you scratch a little bit under the surface and a lot of people who are, whether they're atheistic or agnostic, you're dealing with somebody that, at the end of the day, has a problem with uh, the kind of things that the God of the Bible does. I think of someone like Albert Einstein, who actually thought the Christians were shortchanging God too much in their preaching, that he must be greater and bigger uh, than they were letting on in the modern world. His problem was the problem of evil. And... Uh, one of the things we have to understand about this little fine print warning up front, um, because I'm going to suggest that the problem of evil is a problem for the unbeliever. Uh, the biblical Christian has an explanation for evil. It may not satisfy everybody. It may not satisfy Christians a lot of times. But there is a coherent explanation for it. The unbeliever does not have an explanation for evil. The problem of evil is going to be a problem of saying evil. We're going to ask the questions, what is it? How can we speak about evil if there's no such thing as good? And what is good? And so that fine print warning I was telling you about, a lot of times the objection will come up when you talk like this, from Christians a lot of times too, not just people who are unbelievers, will say to me sometimes, well, you can't say that to somebody on their deathbed. I mean, all that logic chopping and stuff like that, that's nice if somebody's up for it, but somebody in the middle of pain, doesn't need an equation or a formula or anything like that. But when it comes to academic halls like this one, that is really blatant hypocrisy. Because the unbeliever has raised the objection, if they're in settings like this, in the midst of affluence, and they have raised it on a logical or evidential level, not as an emotional struggle. Now, it is an emotional struggle too, so here's the fine print. I'm not saying that there is no problem of evil. There's what we Christians would call a pastoral problem of evil. Uh, somebody who's not a Christian might call it an existential problem of evil. It's a problem that hurts, it's real, and the pain is real, and, and in that sense ought to be. So there's no, there can be any sloughing off of that at all during this talk. There is a problem of evil. What we're saying is that there is not a coherent, logical problem of evil. And what we're going to see as we look at the history of the problem of evil, when it starts to shift as atheists have done, from David Hume to J.L. Mackey in the 20th century, shifted from a logical problem of evil, because I think deep down inside they see it doesn't work, to an evidential problem of evil. And when they do that, you're going to see that it's still, ultimately, trying to smuggle in a logical problem. So, to repeat, there is a pastoral, existential problem of evil, but not a validly logical one. So... The vast majority of Christians on this subject in the modern world have really done a disservice to people who have heard about this idea. Because the vast majority of modern Christian thinking on this subject is often a pathetic attempt to get God off of the hook, which is a task that he has not given to us. Too many Christians have become convinced that the better the answer, the more heartless our approach to real people, real problems. But that is exactly the reverse. When a person needs when their suffering is a sufficient conviction of God's goodness, his wisdom, his power, before suffering hits, preferably, so that their grip on their only true hope is not shaken. What's really heartless is to paint the picture of a reality where suffering is unintelligible, where constant blessing is a given. And if you turn on Christian television today, and I use that oxymoron very oxymoronically, you will hear nothing but a world where God wants to bless everyone. That's not Christianity. Two things we're going to look at. First of all, more of a 
was sort of a heartless beginning, but I want to challenge you to, to not take it that way, and that is where we're going to actually put into crosshairs the philosophical problem of evil. So we're going to be dealing with people not who are suffering in Calcutta, to make light of that. We're going to be uh, dealing with people who probably never been to a place like Calcutta, but have been in academic halls in the West where if you increase the money supply and you're more comfortable, you tend to have this problem more than people who are living in the third world. We're going to look at the problem with the problem of evil, and we're going to criticize it, not the pain that people are under. But when we do that, we're not going to be looking at something where the Christian is yet responsible to give their answer. That'll come. That's the second part. All we're dealing with right now is the first question, does the logical problem of evil make good on its claims? Does it actually demonstrate, does it logically prove that these attributes of God, which we'll list three, are they actually incompatible with the existence of evil in this world? And if they're not, then the logical problem of evil falls regardless of whether or not the Christian has an answer. Once we establish that, clear the rubble, then we're going to build the foundation and we're going to explain what the Christian uh, explanation for God's ways in this universe is, and you can be, and in that section we're going to be doing a lot of things that's going to sound a lot like you're in church, but it's the Christian view, and um, you can criticize me afterwards, and I'll stay all night too, as long as they will let me stay here, but uh, that's the order we're going in. First of all, let's look at the problem with the problem, and that's David Hume, and you don't wear clothes like that to Calcutta, so I'm pretty much thinking that he was slightly pompous. I'm just going out on a limb there, but let's just look at what he was looking at in a book that he wrote in the 1750s called Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. The basic definition of the problem of evil, you can go all the way back to the ancient world to Lucretius, but we're not going to go back that far. We're just going to go back to Hume, 18th century Scottish philosopher, skeptic, naturalist, where he sets up a dialogue, three guys, and uh, he speaks mostly through the mouthpiece of Philo against the simple practical explanations of Cleanthes, and the more sophisticated theology of a guy named Demius. And the problem is as follows. This is the basic summary. You want the most basic summary of what the problem of evil is? This is uh, the best you can get by Hume. He says, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence, then, is evil? So if you know anything about the logical argument for atheism, you may remember that it involves either the claim that God is incoherent in himself, in other words, certain attributes of God don't go together, or that God and the world are incoherent, that certain attributes of God are incompatible with the way the world is. Those are your two basic ways to show, logically, the non-existence of God. So it's either God versus God, a theology, or God versus world, a theology. Hume's objection basically works with divine omnipotence and goodness. Now, if you're an atheist, you can add omniscience to that. You know, maybe God uh, wants to do something about it. Maybe he's powerful enough, but maybe he doesn't know what to do. He didn't get directions to that particular tragedy or something else, so he doesn't know, or something to that effect. Well, Hume starts with omnipotence. So in this world we have evil. If God is good, and if evil exists, then he must be unable to stop it. If he is able to stop it, but doesn't, then it would seem that he's not good. Or perhaps he's willing and able if he only knew how, but he doesn't. So the first thing we have to notice about the logical problem of evil is that the objection depends on the reality that one or more of these four attributes don't go together. I don't want to disappoint anybody tonight, but that's all logic is. It's not the same thing as evidence, which is probabilistic. That's in science and history, those methods. Logic, or mathematics, formal thinking, deals with necessary certain knowledge, assuming you're right about what you plug into it. But it shows what cannot possibly be the case. And so all logic is doing is showing that one or more of these things cannot go together, a bit like saying square circles or married bachelors, or this pen is not a pen, or something to that effect. That's all that logic does. And the form of the logical problem of evil is what we call the God versus world scenario. And so it's that fourth attribute, namely, whoops, sorry, evil in the world, 
that fourth thing that doesn't go together with the other things. But what do we need to know to establish this claim? To show that these things cannot coexist in the same world. Well, what I want to show you is that there's two things you would have to know to show that evil in the world negates the possibility of God's existence. The first thing you need to know is a definition of good sufficient to say that evil is really incompatible with it. And I'm going to deal later with maybe some objections to say, well, fine, there's no such thing as objective evil, but there's still evil. Right. We'll get to that. It's, it doesn't go very far, but uh, if, if you realize what's wrong with that, you realize that one thing you need is a definition of good sufficient to say that evil is really incompatible with it. But here's the second thing. You're going to need to know every single possible way in which God either could or would bring about good out of any particular instance of evil. In other words, you're going to need omniscience. In other words, if the moral argument against God is going to work at all, then divine goodness and divine omniscience must exist. But once we see that develop, we're going to realize that that's just another way to say that in order for the moral argument against God to work, God is going to have to exist. So let's draw this out a little bit with the help of David Hume. Let's see what Hume was thinking, or at least uncritically assuming in his statement. He begins by saying, is God... Willing to prevent evil, but not able, then he is impotent. So far, so good, because all you're doing there is you're putting power against the negation of power. I absolutely agree with that. Intent is off the table for the moment, and the first question assumes that God desires to prevent evil, but is not able. But let's take a good look at the second question to see if anything begins to be smuggled in. It says, is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. So Hume is assuming here that if God is able to stop evil, but does not, then he's evil. But which evil is Hume talking about? Does he mean real evil, which exists in particular things, or does he mean merely the idea of evil? Does he mean all evil, or only some? Does he mean that a good being would annihilate this evil presently, finally, or absolutely? So let's begin to unpack the significance of why I ask all those follow-up questions with one thing that Hume cannot possibly mean, and you're going to see the whole house of cards start to fall down at this point. Suppose he were to mean that goodness per se, the existence of goodness, cannot coexist with evil per se. They can't go together in the same universe, the same reality. Do you see the trouble with that? If good cannot coexist with evil, then if evil exists, good does not. Everybody follow that so far? If good cannot coexist with evil, then if evil exists, good does not. But then if good does not exist, then evil is a meaningless concept, because it depends upon a real standard to which the evil thing does not measure up. Hence, if there's no such thing as good, then there can be no such thing as evil. And therefore, the argument that good and evil cannot coexist is self-refuting to the degree that it depends on the existence of evil. While good may not depend on evil, evil does depend on good. Now, let's assume that Hume does not mean that. But we're going to start to see that whatever he does mean is going to collapse into that same logical black hole. Suppose now that he means that a good personal being cannot coexist with evil per se. But then Hume cannot exist because he, at least, is a personal being capable of condemning evil. Now, of course, I know that's not the particular personal being that Hume has in mind here, but the problem is not going to go away for the objector. If a perfectly good being cannot coexist with evil precisely because he would destroy it, then it would seem that he has to know two more things. He would have to know both what evil is and what that particular instance of evil is. So he has to know evil in general, and he has to know evil in particular. A perfectly good being would destroy evil. He has to know what evil is. And if a perfectly good being who would destroy evil 
is going to do that, he's going to have to know his target. He's going to have to know a particular instance of evil so that he can destroy it. But unfortunately for our objector, if such a being must do this of necessity, then he would have to do it instantaneously. Because remember, the one cannot logically exist, not evidentially, not in circumstances in time. It logically cannot exist if the other exists. But if he did it instantaneously in every case, then evil could never exist in any form, not even in his mind. Evil would be a logical impossibility, and no mind, not even an all-knowing mind, could possibly attribute anything to it, because it wouldn't be a thing. It would be a meaningless combination of words like square circle or married bachelor. And consequently, the standard breaks down as a perfectly good being, by definition, must eliminate all evil in all cases, but could never know what he's eliminating because it could never exist in any case. Anybody have a headache yet? All right. Now, the moment we backpedal from all that and say, no, 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 evil can exist. It can exist at a point just for its annihilation. Or you could say, no, 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 no. An evil thought or a thought about evil could exist in his mind for time. But I have to ask, at that point, what exactly is the difference now between that objection and what the Christian worldview is saying? Because the biblical worldview is saying that God has ordained evil for a time and is determined to destroy it. Now all we're haggling over is the time. And the moral praiseworthiness or blameworthiness of that time. So there's no logical difference anymore at this point. Now let's move along. Suppose we raise the stakes by saying that a being who's good enough to be the standard of goodness and powerful enough to stop anything which opposes it would certainly do so. So here I'm just adding all the language that all the atheistic philosophers in the 20th century have added to Hume. Basically, they haven't done anything new. They've just regurgitated Hume and then piled a couple of new words and sentences on top of his failed project. But a being who was that good and that powerful would certainly destroy you. So the question is actually not mere ability for Hume. It includes intent. A good God not only could stop all evil, he would stop this evil. And so he says, is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. If God is not willing to stop all evil, then he's not good. But on what basis does he make this claim? Is this really the sort of thing on which logic can decide anymore? That God should allow evil to continue until one final victory over it might violate our sensibilities. But I'd like to see which law of logic it violates. Consequently, what we've been going around calling logical in this problem of evil is really at best an evidential argument which works by greater or lesser degrees of probability. And that's going to have the same ultimate problems. But atheists in the 20th century, as I said, have tried to keep Hume's flat earth society afloat. One particular thinker, J.L. Mackey, wrote a book, or wrote an, an essay, in a lot of other books on it, Evil and Omnipotence. And he did this by injecting more meaning into each premise. So here's what he said. He said, good is opposed to evil in such a way that a good thing always eliminates evil as far as it can. And, there's two things he's saying, good thing always eliminates an evil thing as far as it can. And that there are no limits to what an omnipotent thing can do. That's bad logic. An omnipotent thing is a thing, right? Yes, it can't at the same time in the same relationship be an om a non-omnipotent thing, right? Violation of the law of non-contradiction. Here's another problem with this thinking. If an omnipotent thing is going to react against other things, do those things have to be themselves and not other things? Yes. So there's two mistakes with this thinking right there. So right there, he's confused. But beyond that, we've already seen that a good thing, if it eliminates a bad thing instantaneously, either evil never exists because good does, or good never exists because there is a problem of evil, which is self-refuting. So Mackey's attempt to pump new life in the Hume's dying system is instantly futile. Now, Mackey got a lot of play because he refuted another Christian idea called, like, a lot of people think he did, a debatable thing. A guy named Alvin Plantinga uh, came up with something called the free will defense. And so Mackey's did a lot of work against that. And so I think Mackey did talk about some things there that I, I think landed some blows. I actually agree. Uh, against some of the aspects of Plantinga's argument, which I'll get to in a little bit. But at any rate, 
just for people, if you're in the philosophy department, Mackey admits, and he's the authority on the subject on the atheistic side, he admits that if there was a Christian argument that essentially said, or a theistic argument, that said that evil is deprivation, such that they're not really opposites anyway, that evil's always within the power of good, the problem largely disappears. Well, I hate to break it to, uh, to Mackey here, but if he would have taken Augustine seriously, and if we were taking the trouble to read Jonathan Edwards and people like that in the Christian tradition, for 20 centuries, the argument that's going around in philosophical circles that's the Christian position has not been the Christian position. And so that thing that he's admitting is the Christian position, and it needs to be resurrected by Christian philosophers. Now, another philosopher admits, this is important, because now we're going to start to shift to an evidential problem of evil, which I don't have in there, so I'll keep that face up. Sorry. But another atheistic philosopher admits, and he uses the example of a parent administering medicine to a sick child, because he's after, he's trying to get under the surface and say, okay, what constitutes uh, an allowable, a morally permissible, a sufficient moral reason for uh, allowing or causing any amount of suffering? So he uses, again, an example that a lot of people can relate to, and that is a, a parent administering medicine to a sick child. And so he says, the fact that he knowingly caused discomfort is not sufficient to remove the parent from the class of perfectly good beings. Whew. Yes, I do that a lot. Uh, as a general statement, he says, a being who permits or brings about an instance of suffering might be perfectly good, providing only that there is a morally sufficient reason for his action, end quote. So he inserts a new premise into this discussion. A morally sufficient reason. An omnipotent and omniscient being would have no morally sufficient reason for allowing instances of suffering. So let me repeat that. This is what this guy, Nelson Pike, says. An omnipotent and omniscient being would have no morally sufficient reason for allowing instances of suffering. Notice the logic language, not evidential language. Did you catch that? Would have no. Could not. There could not be such a sufficient reason is what he said. Now, he's either confused or he's smuggling logic back into an evidential question. Now, demonstrating this is going to be a pretty tall order. There would be no morally sufficient reason to allow an instance of suffering. If you want to up the stakes a little bit, to allow a really egregious or horrible instance of suffering. But behind all of this is the thought, if I do not know why such evil makes sense, then it follows that such evil makes no sense. If I don't see, if I don't know how such evil makes sense, then it follows that such evil makes no sense. Now, nobody says it. We usually cut out the whole if-then language because we know deep down that it would no longer be an emotional or a personal issue then, but one in which all of the normal rules of logic still hold sway. In fact, you'd have to be omniscient in order to demonstrate the logical problem of evil, since one would have to know all possible good reasons for God to decree evil in order to say that none of them are really good or really work in the end. You see that? In order to say about every particular instance of suffering, I have to know how that particular instance of suffering doesn't measure up to the good way that that being, thing, person was treated. So what's left? With human as followers shifting from logic to evidence, the evidential problem never succeeds. It never succeeds in being anything other than smuggled logic or smuggled emotion. Usually. An example is brought out like, what about an animal suffering in the wilderness? And of course, we all, oh, that's a hard one to answer because I don't see how the animal is going to grow from this, and so on and so forth. So that constitutes a defeater. Or closer to home, something like someone being raped, someone being abused. How about the Holocaust? If I'm invited back, I want to talk about that when we talk about the law above the law and who really believes that that's evil and who doesn't. And so instances of particular evil or degrees of pain are brought in 
by philosophers to change the subject. Be it the senseless evil of a stray bullet, someone being raped, or even animal suffering. The examples are aimed at our emotions. But they're still trying to do the same thing. This is the difficult part of having conversations about these things. Not because the objection is good or changes what we've just seen, but because there's a public relations battle going on. Discredited logic is being smuggled in on the freight train of sympathetic appeal. And there should be sympathy there. But that's a separate question than whether or not the premises of logic hold. Well, what are the necessary conditions for evil to exist? Because it may surprise you to know, and I think it does surprise a lot of people that bring up this objection, that the Christian worldview insists that evil is actually worse than you thought. Evil, far from being an embarrassment to the Christian worldview, is one of our first premises. It's not for the unbeliever. So it's very ironic here. The whole thing is going over our head because of the pain and the emotion and the trauma that it rightly causes. Necessary conditions for evil. The ultimate problem for the problem of evil, again, is what I call the problem of saying evil. The Christian has a coherent explanation and the unbeliever does not. C.S. Lewis explains his own journey from agnosticism to Christian theism in this way in Mere Christianity. He said, if a good God made the world, why has it gone wrong? And for many years, I simply refused to listen to the Christian answers to the question. But then that threw me back into another difficulty. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole show was bad and senseless from A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such violent reaction against it? A man feels wet when he falls into water, because man is not a water animal. A fish would not feel wet. Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying that it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. But the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. Thus, in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, namely my idea of justice, was full of sense. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it had no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe, and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. So let's not make things too difficult here. Simple definition time. What do we mean by the word bad? If I was to ask you for a definition of bad. Let me do that for a second. You probably have it in mind, oh, let me come something clever here. It's kind of a sentence. Raise your hand if you want a definition of, give me a definition of bad. Freaked you out by saying it's too simple, didn't I? All right. How about this one? Not good. Is that a good one? I think it is. I think that's what we mean. I mean, isn't that obvious at the end of the day? Not the way things ought to be. Not the way that thing that we're talking about ought to be. Now, can the atheist mean anything objective by the word evil? Such that by objective evil, real evil, it's really bad we would mean that which is morally blameworthy at all times for all agents. Well, the atheist can't say it unless he also has the idea of objective good that is morally praiseworthy at all times for all agents. But what would have to be true about the world for there to be an objective good for all times and for all agents? Something that you simply must conform yourself to. Something that would be morally blameworthy not if somebody catches you, not if you don't happen to personally benefit from it and so on, but simply because it is wrong for all people at all times. Goodness, rightness, justice, these things are either real things, unchanging, eternal, 
abiding over every single person and known by everybody deep down inside, or else there's no such thing whatsoever. Nothing but subjectivism, relativism, might makes right, counting noses, breaking noses, whatever you have to do to come up with your moral consensus in society. Well, let's look at what the skeptic actually has to be committed to. Not simply with what he's left with, but what his own view demands to be the case. The atheist is actually committed to all of the things that we mean by evil. He's committed to all the things he means by evil. He's committed to natural evil because nature is all there is. You can't call something unnatural if nature is all there is. You say, well, there's a glitch in the system. Well, where did that come from? If nature is all there is, there's no such thing as unnatural. There's no such thing as an otherwise, a moral oughtness, a way things ought to be. He's committed to social evil. Oh, that's different. The man is different. We have a unique opportunity among the animals. No, you don't. You're just an animal. Survival is fit. You just like everything in nature because you just are nature. He's committed to social evil because these are nothing but the natural selection of the species eliminating weaker strands. Universal evolution doesn't seek to explain suffering so much as it demands it. The naturalist, the person that believes that nature is all there is, cannot draw lines around this or that natural phenomenon and call it evil by smuggling in the equally meaningless word suffering. Suffering is meaningless in a non-theistic reality. Not because it's not a real phenomenon, but because it has no more significance than any other unit of matter and energy. Why should anyone who's not suffered care that others have suffered? If someone responds by saying, well, just in case you do, do unto others. Well, there's a lot of different ways I could take that. Does this vicarious social sufferer want me to care in the sense of gaining a perspective? Why does he or she care that I have a perspective? Does this person want me to join the cause of identifying and eliminating causes of suffering? Again, I have to ask, why should I care about a group suffering any more than I care about individuals in that group suffering? And if you come full, full circle and respond, well, because you just should. It would be wrong not to. Well, then you're just starting where we start. You're saying something that's true, but you're not moving us beyond. The difference is, I can tell you why we ought to care. And the atheist can't. And so the question does not go away. Why does the atheist complain about evil when all of the things that he means by evil are utterly necessary to his meaningless universe? Let's just take one example. Let's take one scene. A concentration camp in Nazi Germany in World War II. Show me the evil. My question for the atheist is show me the evil. What's he going to say? Well, you see those brown shirts are doing over there? Yeah, so do I not get a job at UPS? No. That's not what I mean. I mean, I mean ovens. Okay. So can I get rid of my oven? No. I mean, what? Destruction of human life? How is that any different than animal life? And if you say, exactly, it's not. Great. How is that any different plant life? Well, that's not either. I'm an environmentalist. Okay, let's up the stakes a little bit. How's it any different than dirt or rocks or matter or energy? In your worldview, you have to bring in something from outside nature and yet at the same time say that there's nothing from outside nature. Everything simply is the way that it is. So by now, before we get to the Christian answer, it should be abundantly clear what we mean by saying that the so-called problem of evil turns out to be the atheist problem of saying evil. The problem is that he can't. It's not objective. By contrast, the consistent theist sees an infinity more evil than the atheist does. It belongs to the whole range of Christian doctrines that virtually everything going on down here is a sin. Not only against one another, but against God himself. Therefore, a believer who is knowledgeable of the scriptures will outcount the atheist by a million to one on the existence of evil. We see infinitely more evil than the atheist does. Because the standard of evil is infinite. The one who we've offended with our treason against him is infinitely worthy of respect and honor and admiration. And so we can outdistance the atheist of infinity to one, or none, on the existence of evil. Well, what is the Christian explanation? 
That is a critique of any other worldview that says that we cannot know what is good, we cannot know what is right, to which I respond, as Lewis did, cannot see a straight line, you cannot call a line crooked. And once we've established that, and there's no foundation to call anything evil unless God has revealed himself, then give me a few minutes to explain what the Christian believes about the existence of evil given the existence of God, and then you can try to tear me apart after. Okay. And I'm calling this a God-centered theodicy, not simply, oh, sorry, the word theodicy, I'm not going to assume that everybody just reads old-fashioned 18th century philosophical works. That word just comes from two Greek words, theos meaning God, a DK meaning justice, and so it's specifically, it's not just an explanation for the ways of God, but for the justice of his ways, for the rightness of his ways. Not because he needs us to stick up for him or anything like that, but just as a service to our fellow people. An explanation for the ways of God. Well, there's three things you're going to want. Three things at least you're going to want in a Christian, in a biblical explanation for the ways of God. Really, you're going to need these three things no matter who you are. But since nobody's left in the building, that might be true literally. I hope not. I hope there's some unbelievers here. Uh, but no matter what your view is, you have to account for these three things. You have to account for their view. You may not know, you may not have personal acquaintance with the ultimate cause. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, does your view in principle take into account an ultimate cause, caused by no other? If not, it's utterly irrational. Does it account for an ultimate good? In other words, does this ultimate cause have a chief end? Give me another night and I'll prove that through logic. The first cause has to have a personal chief end. You can show that by logic alone. If you're not, your view is illogical. Thirdly, you must have an ultimate means by which. In order to have a fully satisfying view, you're going to want to Look at the center stage of history and say, okay, great, explain that. Explain the Holocaust. Explain this. Explain what Christians have done. Now, I'll be happy to take those questions afterwards. But all I'm doing right now is explain to you what the Christian answer to these three things are. All right. The Odyssey is where we move from the problem of saying evil to the biblical explanation for the ways of God. But here's where we discover that the biblical answer is not simply an explanation for the existence of evil, but the only solution to it. In the Christian view, God is defeating evil, and he will utterly destroy it in the end. But he will only do so on his terms. He certainly won't do so by honoring the terms of evil. And it may surprise you, or it may not surprise you to know that in the Christian view, all of the people who bring up this question are evil, including those of us who defend it. And so, that you may not like that, but that is logically coherent. That the ultimate standard of good cannot depend on an evil thing, an evil being, in order to define itself. Okay? Now, what's the first thing here? God's chief end. In recent times, a more popular view has come out, and it's probably the one you've heard of. And you don't even have to read philosophers to get this idea. The most popular expression of it is in C.S. Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain. It happened to be the first book of Lewis that I read. Uh, and I like Lewis so much, it's not a problem, you know, I, I like Lewis, but I think his theology really shows that he's not a theologian at this point. Because in that book there's some problems in his problem of pain. But uh, the, more, the most sophisticated version of this argument is called the free will defense a guy named Alvin Flanagan. This has not been the Christian answer and Christian explanation for 20 centuries. A handful of people starting in the 17th, 18th century dabbled down this road, particularly uh, Hugo Grotius and others in the British and English tradition. But this was not the dominant idea. This is a very apologetic, not in the sense of Christian apologetics, but it's apologizing to the world, apologizing for God because he's sort of that embarrassing family member who's really getting out of control and we needed to clean up this mess for him. This is not what the Christian worldview has said for 20 centuries. But let me just briefly explain how this works. Number one, in this view, 
God must create the best of all possible worlds. All right, well, I'll go with that. Sounds good. Best of all possible worlds. Whatever God does is perfect, so I'll go with number one. Number two, the best of all possible worlds implies love. Again, perfect. Which love implies the freedom to reject that love? Hold on to that. That's why I'm going to drive in a wedge. Because you're going to lose pretty much every Christian doctrine right at that point. Love implies the freedom to reject that love. Thirdly, the free rejection of God's <coughs> love is the origin of evil. So what's going on here? Not just an explanation for evil, but very broad in its scope, an explanation for the origin of evil. That's a thorny philosophical problem. Well, as a side note to this, planning, I came up with an idea called trans-world depravity, or the possibility, or at least the high probability, that evil must exist in any world where God creates other personal beings capable of love. And this is where a couple of atheistic philosophers like Matthew have called planning on rightly, because it's pretty much not theism at all, it's <coughs> dualism, because you make goodness depend on evil in order to have not just anything, but the best of things. And there you lose the existence of God. These are philosophers in the Christian world, not theologians, and not as careful as they should be on these points. Three problems with this modern idea that you may have heard as Christianity. And why am I doing this? I don't attack uh, other Christians in front of other people, Christians, non-Christians, and so on. Well, if I'm trying to give you what I think the Christian worldview is, I've got to clear away a lot of the cobwebs of maybe some false ideas that you might have. Three problems. First of all, I already mentioned it. Number one, God would depend upon evil in order to create the best things. Remember, love, being among the best things, is necessary to the best of all possible worlds. And I agree with that part, that love is necessary to the best of all possible worlds. I just believe God is love, not us, and then he can caught the cold from us. Uh, that's not theism anymore. Secondly, here's the second problem with this idea. If the essence of love demands the possibility of rejecting that love, then God, who the Bible says is love, should be more susceptible to this than anyone else. Imagine the members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bowing out under irreconcilable differences with each other. If the essence of love demands the possibility of rejecting that love, then it would seem that God would be more susceptible to this than any other being. So you lose the doctrine of God. Thirdly, you lose heaven. You lose eternal life. The hope of heaven, in this view, is our own free will. And thus there's no good answer to the question over whether we will ever fall away from God then as much as now. And hence the doctrines of divine goodness, the Trinity, and the heaven, and heaven are all annihilated by the free will defense. The reality is that that argument was not necessary to begin with. The Bible has an answer to the problem of evil. And you can find it in the last couple chapters of Job and in Romans 9. And in both places, God essentially says to people who should be asking the question, why hasn't God killed me the first time I sinned? Why didn't God, who has all power to destroy his enemies, destroy someone like me? Maybe you're better than me, but I say that every day. That's the right question. And the Bible is saying in the end of Job and Romans 9, essentially, where were you when I created the world? Show me if you have the blueprints for stretching out the stars and the heavens and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking to Job. And he says in Romans 9, will the clay rise up to the potter and say, why have you made me like this? Has not the potter the right to make of his own clay that which he wills? Well, the Christian oftentimes is afraid of answering this question, and especially in an unphilosophical age as ours, with all of our banality and popular literature, we tend to answer the question in our, embar in our embarrassment. And so we reason that if God is the author of all things, then and evil is a thing, well then 
God's the author of evil, and you don't want to be the author of evil. So where did that phrase come from? It doesn't come from the Bible. Who told us to get God off the hook on that? The classical Christian theist answer. And you can find it especially in Augustine, and even, strangely, in Lewis. Lewis does get this in another one of his books. The Christian answer is this. Number one, God created every existent thing. So a substance. In the Christian world, you would call that creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. He speaks and it stands. Think of the most subatomic level. Boom. His word, the ultimate algorithm, creating out of nothing, information. Which information? I like a light switch, computer programming. You got two options, being or non-being. And so by his word, by his decree, he makes things stand where if he, Job 34, 15 says, if he should withdraw his word and spirit, all flesh would return to dust. That's called the second law of thermodynamics. Disintegration. Entropy. That's the Christian position. That God has created everything like that. Secondly, evil is not a substance. It's the privation of substance. You say, what, it's, it's illusion? It's an illusion? No. Try turning the lights off for a second. I'm not sure how dark are we getting here, so don't do it. But uh, do, can evil things happen in the dark? Sure. Are they more likely to happen in the dark? Yeah. Okay. But what's darkness? You see, like a Star Wars dual yang thing, downside of the force? No. Same as death. The absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. It's not an illusion, but neither is it real in the sense of having substance. It's that falling away, disintegrate, that second law of thermodynamics, the unwinding, the disintegration of the information that God has decreed. Therefore, God did not create evil, even though he ordained it. Now, that's an old-fashioned word. It just means he caused it. Wait a minute. If he caused it, he created it. No. He caused all sorts of things without creating it. In fact, have you ever caused anything? Yeah, every time I breathe, I cause it carbon dioxide and all this stuff, and I'm causing stuff all the time. Have you ever created those things out of nothing? Huh, not one of them. Right. So in fact, everything works like this. Not only does the word that nothing works like that, everything works like that. Everything works by secondary causes, material causes, formal causes, instrumental causes. The key ball goes into the eight ball, but it doesn't create it. Its velocity is picked up by that and lost by it, but it doesn't create it. Nevertheless, it causes it. So in fact, everything works like this, if we just stop and think about it for a second. One theologian in a particular book said it like this. He says a lot easier, so listen to his words. He has a couple of analogies. He says, evil is not a substance, but a corruption of the good substances God made. Evil is like rust to a car or rot to a tree. It is a lack in good things, but is not a thing in itself. Evil is like a wound in an arm, or moth holes in a garment. It exists only in another, but not in itself. It is important to note that a privation is not the same as absence. Sight is absent in a stone as well as in a blind person. But the absence of sight in a stone is not a privation. Since the stone by nature ought not to see, it is not deprived of sight as is the blind man. Evil, then, is a deprivation, not a mere negation, of some good that ought to be there. Now, this absolutely troubles a lot of people. And, as I said, it troubles a lot of believers as well. And so they'll say, no, 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 no. God did not ordain that. That would mean he caused it, and I get all your analogies, but let's forget about that for a second. What really happened is we misused our will. We, it was a misuse of our freedom. Well, no doubt, sin is a misuse of our freedom. Freedom is a thing. Freedom has a nature. Freedom is a good thing that God has given us. And nevertheless, we misuse it. I agree with you. But this misuse of our will, is it a thing or isn't it? Well, yeah, if I want to believe a 
free will is a pretty important thing. I have to at least believe it's a thing, so I'll go with yes, okay? Well, two, is it caused or uncaused? Well, if it's uncaused, it kind of makes it God. That's polytheism right there. Uh, I'm going to go with caused, right? So if you say to me, I know what caused the first sin in Adam or Lucifer. It was the misuse of their free will. Wonderful. That's the material cause. I agree with you completely. Didn't answer the question. How that first evil desire get there? Are you saying that God planted that and that? No, not at all. But God creates the apple. It's good. And if it falls, it rots. Think again of that light switch. If you turn it off, where does the light go? Does it create darkness? Somebody open up a box of darkness and the darkness gets out? Or is it the light fuses and darkness ensues? So this is what God is doing. Romans 8.20 said that the creation itself is subject to futility, not by its own will, but by him who subjected it in hope. Isaiah 45.7, God says, I create light and darkness, well-being and calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Amos 3, 6 says, Does disaster come upon a city unless the Lord has caused it? So God did not create evil, but he did cause it. He was the ultimate author in all things that have come about for his own ends. Real question we should be asking are, what are those ends? Because at this point, we still might be saying, wait a minute. That, that still doesn't get him off the hook. I know, and I'm not trying to. And wouldn't it be refreshing if more Christians didn't try to do that and apologize for God? Because he needs no apologies here. God ordained these things, caused these things. The real question is creating and causing the same thing. We've already seen that they're not. So let me take it one step further. Is God committing evil in causing evil? He didn't create evil. Everything God creates is always perfectly good. So the question is no longer metaphysical at this point. Can he do that? He's a creator in the Christian worldview. The question is, is it morally permissible for him to do that? Can God create something, uphold it in existence by his word? Hebrews 1, 3 says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians 1, 17 says that in him all things hold together. Can he let it go? Well, he can, metaphysically. Morally, is it permissible for God to let go to its own nature that which he creates? Well, I don't have any objection against him, because if he's the first cause, and there's no moral argument I can use against God, as we've already seen in the problem of saying evil, so no. And that's exactly right. There is no argument against God not being morally able to create things and then let them return to their own nature. Which, by the way, is what the objector wants anyway. You want to be left alone by God. And that's what he does. He lets us go to our own nature. Which is not a good thing at the end of the day, as we'll see. What does Jesus say about the problem of evil? We'll wrap it up with this. Luke chapter 13, somebody actually did address this very question. I don't know if you know that, but Jesus was propositioned with the problem of evil. And people were bringing up examples of evil things that could happen. You can fill in the blank with things like Katrina or 9-11. You could fill in the blank any of those things. Because they brought up these examples of a tower that fell in their day. And an evil act of tyranny that happened in their day. And so in Luke 13, 1-5, Jesus says, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And 
that point, I suppose, if a philosopher was there, he would have scratched his head and said, Jesus, you're changing the subject. That wasn't the question. The question was, what about those people that the tower fell on, and what about those people that Pilate killed and mixed their blood with the blood of the sacrifices, and so on and so forth? Jesus said, I did address it. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That could have been you. And, according to Jesus, that should have been you. God would be right to judge traitors. And so the assumption that Jesus is working with is that everybody has sinned against God. And so in the Christian best of all possible world scenario, everything works logically, but almost nothing works in our own hearts. That's because as traitors to God, our hearts are not right with God. So I can stand here all night and say, God's maximum glory, in other words, his absolute intention to do exactly what he wanted to do for his own purposes, will be done. There's no objection against that. I can't, I can't say the future. I can't tell that it won't happen. I don't have any moral objection to it as I see. How does that square with man's happiness? Well, you know the biblical answer for this, if you have any background in church or with the Bible. And I know you may have come here to hear a philosophical lecture or something else. But the biblical answer is ultimately the good news of Jesus Christ. Because God solves this problem completely on his own terms. And we, and all the people who will ever raise this question, have violated those terms. And the terms are terms of peace. There's terms of peace because there's a war. The Bible says that Jesus is our peace in Ephesians 2. God is actually at war against sinners. Read Romans 1. Sinners aren't just at war with God. We don't just need a change of mind, a change of heart, see things God's way. He's big enough, he'll let bygones be bygones. Well, of course, we're sinners. We don't think sin is a big deal. Because we don't think God is a big deal. But what did God do about this? Well, when human beings rebelled against him, God, as a God of justice, must punish all sin. He has to. The slightest sin, if it is a sin against someone who is infinitely worthy of our worship as he has created us for him, is a sin that is worth an infinite punishment, which is what eternal judgment is. So he must punish all sin. All sin will be punished, either on the traitor in that eternal judgment or on a substitute. And so God sent his son to step in the way of that judgment on behalf of his people. So that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. In God's greatest glory, he gets all the glory, he gets all the credit, because he puts his son forward. He proves that he punishes justice, or he punishes with his justice, sinners. But he also proves his love by making his son step in the way of that bullet, so to speak. And all he asks, all he invites us to do is to trust him for that and to get over our pride that we can earn his favor, that we can make the world better. And by the way, Christianity and the Christian gospel is not an invitation to not make the world better and just escape because you're going to go to heaven one day. But this life is fleeting. And our best attempts on our best day, after centuries of evidence, Show that our best efforts on our best day are only going to produce more evil and misery. And so God is most glorified by sending his son to crush his son. Isaiah 53.10 says that it was the will of God to crush his son. To have his son take all of the evil and all of the pain and all of the penalty that we've earned so that we don't have to pay that in eternal judgment. And so that is the Christian answer to the problem of evil. He solves it. He does it on his terms. He does it in a way that he gets the credit. And 
all who are his get to live forever in everlasting happiness. So you can't do any better than that. So let me open it up to questions. And nothing is off limits at all. You can bring up whatever you want on the problem of evil. Let me just click this twice. Do you want to field questions? Yeah. Okay, so I don't have any questions. By the way, I realized I didn't cover, I didn't scratch the surface. I'm well aware of that. I don't want anything I say to, you know, like the scorched earth policy thing at the beginning. It doesn't mean that I cover everything. So please feel free to wing it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, sure that was, uh... So I thought you were going to ask more general, so I guess i got to go specific here on that one. I was going to say there's a lot of things about God that wouldn't be, and I didn't cover that. It's a pretty huge thing not to cover. Um, there's a lot of things about God that get to be displayed and enjoyed in his people that wouldn't be on display if evil didn't happen. But that does relate to the specific thing, because there are some things, a lot of things, about somebody being great. For example, does anybody care that somebody's being great? So how about courage to stop that person to say, well, what about after? Okay. You have things like justice, the justice system going out, punishing uh, That doesn't do anything for the person. Okay. And then you have things, whether no matter what kind of abuse it is, you're talking about something that is really the hardest thing in this, because it doesn't affect any of things we've said, but it just challenges our hearts to such an extent. And I, I think if you were to divide up the world in a pie chart and people that have suffered and people who have not suffered as much, you'll find it divides evenly between atheists, theists, Christians, people of other religions, people of no religion. And it wouldn't necessarily be an indicator of other good things that God's bringing out of it. So that person that's been raped, that person that's been abused, I know a lot of people, I know you do too, in the church who have been raped or abused and who have and they've never said to the day they die, well, it was, it was an illusion or something like that, and God was using it. And sort of this happy, giddy, frivolous, you know, God is not calling us to be, you know, masochists or anything, or deny evil and be stupid about it. We're not to seek out suffering and things like that. But those people will tell you that they are a different person in ways that are mysterious, and they would never be on the side of playing God or, or uh, being glib about it. But God used those things to show himself, um, as he did to Job in the Bible. I was a real person with real suffering, whole family wiped out. And he ended it by saying, I thought I knew you, but now I see you. And I can tell you from personal experience um, of use and how God has used that uh, in my life to make me a different person, to make me um, count things that are usually very valuable to young people. Um, just those options weren't available. God took them, and it hurt like hell. And I'm glad he did. And you say, well, that's still a thing for everybody. Because not everybody's at that place. Like that. And that just makes it more complicated to get into some of the stuff about the gospel and how God seeks out people. So it's ultimately, if the question becomes, why did God do this to me? Give me specifics. I've got two or three general things that the Bible will say, and then there's a whole list of things that God's never going to tell him. And I think it's important to not mistake our ability to know exactly what God's doing. God's ability to do that. Um, and it's a fact. That's not, this is, that's not an answer that says, don't, don't ask that question. Because it's, it's not. It's a, it's a great question. It's not going to go away. It's going to hurt more. 
day you die in a sense. But um, but God does use that. He does know what you're doing. Yeah. And it's and for the Christian, it's something that God translates into hope and an increased faith and makes them a different person. And somebody who does not have Christ leads to more confusion, more doubt. And so there's a, there's actually a bigger question, even the bad. Some things the Bible tells us that, that are actually the biggest things. He does it for his own glory, which is really good news because if God made us to feed on him like a plant feeds on sunlight, we're made to be happy in God. We see, the more we see of God, the more we know God, the more we'll love God and our soul will be capable of enjoying it. Therefore, the best news for us is that God is a God-centered God. God seeks to glorify himself in all that he does. Is that, and that means we have more enjoyment. The problem is, in sin, our souls are not wired to God that we're, we're, we're Somebody once said that the, um, the, the, uh, the sinner can't find God for the same reason that a bank robber can't find a cop. Okay? So the sinner is not seeking after God. His, his soul is not wired to love God, to enjoy God, to please Him. And so it's very counterintuitive at first. The bigger we see God being presented, it seems like we're being crowded out. We're becoming less significant when, in fact, it's just the opposite. So, big picture of God's glory. We know that. We know what he's going to do when he did with Christ. But in individuals, it seems like the big picture to us because we're the ones that are in pain, the ones that are suffering. And so, in those things, what specifically is God doing with you in your own life? That is infinite mystery. You know, little bits here and there, but you scratch the surface. Yeah, yeah. I'd say three things. First, um, the atheist is in the unfortunate position, much like the uh, sometimes the atrocities of the Old Testament, as I'll call it. Although in this case, it's very different because we Christians, I think, will agree with uh, people in the world that say that is evil. That's absolutely evil. So that's the second thing I'd say. Not that the atheist would have no ground to say that. That would, that would still be logically meaningless for him. But secondly, I would say the Christian can say, yes, that was evil. It didn't measure up to the Bible. It didn't measure up to Christ's teachings. When you look at Islam, for example, you see evil perpetrated straight out of the example of Muhammad and the teaching. When you see that in Christianity, you don't see that coming out. People will say, wait a minute, in the Old Testament, Joshua was commanded to kill the Amalekites and so on and so forth. And show people how in the Old Testament, 
God was commanding Israel to do something as a theocracy that was a special event. It's, there's many things in, throughout the Bible, not just the New Testament, that strongly suggest that that is not a, a universal. So that's the second thing. The third thing I would say, and I don't want to start with this because I don't want to give people the wrong idea that I'm taking back what I said, because I don't want to draw teams that I'm going to defend in history. I, I personally don't find any age in history to be this romantic glory days that we want to return to and stuff like that. But I would say as a matter of historical fact, Inquisitions, Crusade, Holocaust, show me evil that is often in the public school system or in college linked to Christianity, and I will show you a bunch of people running that thing that were not Christians at all. And the main thing they were attacking oftentimes is the Bible, particularly in the Spanish Inquisition. Um, you had a largely Roman Catholic element, not just running their show against Jews and Muslims in southern Spain, but also against the reformers once it really kicked back in the gear at the beginning of the 16th century. And so you show me an inquisition, and I'll show you a, a stack of Bibles being burned. I, was, it's, it's sim I would just say it simply wasn't Christians doing it, although, again, there, I want to qualify that, it is possible to get caught up on the wrong side of history even if you're on the wrong side of eternity sometimes. And I think, uh, yeah, I think, it's, I don't want to say that there were no Christians who got caught up in things that were evil. But if you, have, you know, study church history, one of the main things that comes out is uh, the, the church of, of Christ, his word, his gospel is 99% of the time, most of the time, um, opposed by the church people professing Christianity, but in fact are just secular heads of state, people that have married together church and state in ways that um, it's very clear that they are just have secular ambitions. So I would say that as we look closer at history, we will see that, that those ideas, those actions are not coming from Scripture and not even coming from genuine Christians in any recognizable sense. Crusades is harder. The Crusades, because there's a lot of Christians that were duped there for indulgences and stuff like that. Riches, uh, mainly indulgences. Uh, favors from the church, salvation, absolution of sins for going into the Holy Land and all that stuff. Yep. Oh, did, oh sorry. Sorry, I, I was just, I went into mode. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not going to, I've got a question. So by progressive, do you just mean liberalism, like liberal theology? Okay. Um, yeah, I would, say, I would say evil, and I would say especially if you look in the Old Testament, one of the things that's most surprising to non-students of the Bible who will hang around the church for a long time, and if they finally encounter the Bible or encounter preaching, they will see that actually if you look at the letters of the New Testament or the prophets, God's audience in the Bible by and large is the church. And he's criticizing the church, prophets, apostles, criticizing the church. Constructive criticism, but um, people who are not really God's people are being told, you're not really God's people. That's a hard pill for us to swallow today, but obviously if you're looking in that light, yes, anything that compromises God's truth or God's way of doing things among his people is evil, especially among the leadership. It's extra evil. I know there's a lot of other questions like, what do we do about it? stuff like that? Maybe you could talk afterwards. Have some ideas. You know, it seems to me that a lot of theologians can operate opposite the scientific method. Where mm -hmm. A scientist can take a body of evidence and uh, come up with mm -hmm. a theory. It seems a lot of theologians take a, uh, a conclusion mm -hmm. and they work up, uh, they search for a body of evidence. Um, the question I have is that how is it exactly is it valid to claim that an atheist does not have the ability to discern evil? I would put it like that. I think an atheist can discern evil because he's made in the image of God. What he can't do is make a coherent uh, case with several premises that say that good does not exist, but then sort of at step 12 say, but evil does exist. So uh, an atheist can discern evil, because, which, which I think is a, is a pretty significant clue that he should change his worldview, because Evil does exist, and so, and because the uh, atheists and Christians both alike are made in the image of God, we rightly have a visceral reaction to see um, what the Nazis did. 
or when we say evil, and when we see a lot of evil things that happen. So, so let me be clear that atheists can discern evil at that gut level, can be right about it, can oftentimes we could be co-belligerents in certain social causes. Um, the difference is more on the, at the academic level, which is not unimportant. That becomes the, the fountainhead of ethics and things like that. Yeah, yeah, which is not, which is not just formal, <coughs> insignificant, you know, pointy-headed stuff. That, you know, what happens in academic halls of one generation issues out into the battlefield in the, in the next generation. And so I believe an atheist can get all, a whole lot of things right, each of which prove our point. Um, but that's a lot of, please invite me back from any other time to go into each of those particular points. Um, the other thing you said, um, so theologians uh, not studying the scientific method. So there's a lot of issues there. I think, um, for starters, the scientific method was taught to us back in third, fourth, and fifth grade in a way that was very naive. Uh, kids, what do you start with? You start with observation. No, you don't. And the best philosophers of science in the 20th century who won Nobel Prizes about it, whether it's Popper or Kuhn or Polanyi, have taught even secularists that. You don't start with induction. The scientific method is not pure induction. You start with a hypothesis. You start with a worldview. You start with assumptions. You start with prejudices. You start with a closed society, government grants, tasers, tanks. That's what you start with. And then you operate within that on your lab table, which is not minimizing science, but it is minimizing, I think, the, the cap, the, uh, what's the word I like? Captives? The captors. Is that a word? Capturers? Yeah, sure. Uh, of, of academia in the modern world. There are largely totalitarian states paying the bills. Not this place. This fine institution. <laughs> For the most part. In the blue state. <laughs> but there's a lot there. I'd, I'd love to keep going on that one. but Because, um, yeah, theologians, to a certain extent, theologians shouldn't start with that kind of scientific method. On the other hand, there's a sense in which you start with a body of data, and there's debates even within Christian circles. What do you start with? Do you start with this part of Scripture? Do you start with the whole of Scripture? Do you start from your tradition? Well, nobody wants to start there anymore. Um, so there's a lot of um, debate about that. And there is an element of of science, of gathering from what you observe, in this case, from scripture. That's your body of data there, which doesn't mean that you don't have other data to work with. But it's, it's complex, and I would say that, let's say there's more scientific elements of theology than, uh, those guys don't get the ink anymore. Get uh, booted out. That's, sorry, there's, there's more there. I, that's an interesting question. I'd love to. Yeah, let's do one on that. Yes, so two questions. Yes, we do create evil. So go back to that first original desire. Is desire good or bad? I said God has desires, love, that's an emotion, that's good. So I'd say that man's desire, woman's desire from the very beginning is perfectly good. So the Bible says, Ecclesiastes 7.29, that God created man upright, but he has sought out many schemes. So every desire in its original form as God created is perfectly good. And so that analogy with the apple, where if the apple's there, it's connected, there's life going to the apple, but then it falls. And in the analogy, it's kind of like the light switch, where the tree in that case is, is God, in the analogy. And he's letting go the apple. And so what does an apple do? Well, an apple does what an apple does, according to the nature of that apple. Well, let's bring the analogy over to human beings. The human being has mind, affections, desire, and, and will. And so is man, when God turns out the lights and his eyes see less and less of God, is it really man doing that? Absolutely. Man's paddling his own way to hell. Hating God, choosing darkness, Loving sin, so notice loving, love is a good thing, it's a perfect thing. He's taking that thing, God has let him go to his own nature. So think of that doctrine of creation again, that Bible-believing Christians believe that God created ex nihilo, out of nothing. So if God lets you go back to your own nature, where is he letting you go to? Back to nothing, without even the ability to exist. Is it still a thing? 
You're still a thing doing according to your own nature. <coughs> you're loving things, you're thinking things, you're doing things. But you're like the rust on that metal, you're deteriorating. Your, your desires are fleeting. It's like someone who's, you know, a, I guess a drunk would be a good analogy. Um, someone who's sprawled out over the porcelain goddess the morning after has less freedom than he did the night before when he sipped his first beer. I just wanted to make something that you all know, relates to. Um, now, is he doing that? Yes. Is he exercising his free will? Yes. Is he still a thing? Is he still the same kind of a thing as he was the night before? Yes. And so I think what, what's happened here in, in modern theology, we've sort of pit necessity against freedom. We've bought that basically naturalistic false dichotomy. That if something has a nature that's necessary to it, it's not free. Well, is the free will a thing? And does it have a nature? So we have this hard distinction between determinism and free will. I know that's a whole other night. I realize that. But um, that is just a false dichotomy. A, a, a will with its desires, that first desire was a thing with a nature. And when God let it go to its own nature, it began to corrupt. Adam freely chose to rebel against God. God allowed, you think God could have stopped? God could have kept him upheld. God could have kept speaking into Adam only light and protected him from that lie. But he didn't. So, and that gets into things about God's creative or decretive will that speaks things into existence, and his permissive will that lets things fall out according to secondary causes. But that's where that line is. Because so many Christians think, well, it's just a mystery. Like, eh, let's not talk about it. That's a lot of information for somebody that doesn't think you can talk about. Um, I think the Bible has a lot to say about it. About God upholding things by his own word and letting things go for his own purposes, his own pleasure. And yet, man is just as responsible. So I, and that's another thing. I think we have this idea that we're more responsible to the degree that I get to write my own story or play God or do part of God's job and stuff like that. But I would just say, where do you see that in Scripture? Where do you see that in logic? That something is more meaningful, more significant, if you got to, like if there's this line between where God's sovereignty and power end and my ability to write the, my own script begins. Um, I think these are just a lot of uncritically accepted ideas from second-rate philosophy to take in and, and spew out. And I think, uh, and it's, it's mysterious stuff. It's, we don't think about it today especially. But um, I think the Bible actually has a lot, a lot to say about it. I feel like on all these questions, like, I'm, like I'm just, I want to keep talking all night. Oh, does the devil exist? Yeah. Yeah. And be, not because I've personally been acquainted with him in that sense. But because, uh, and, and so there is a place in, in the Christian worldview for taking things on faith because the Bible says it, which is not irrational at all. On the basis of all the things that the Bible checks out about, I see that God, as the author of Scripture, is trustworthy in things like that are mysterious, like spiritual beings. We have two more questions, and then we'll open it up to just an informal question and answer time on the floor. So, there's one more. I want to back to something we talked about the whole topic of If something happens to a person that was really bad, and then they lived to have right. they could see that maybe God <coughs> had some plan in it for them. Right. Those people did good, and I can't think that God would just, I mean, he's got to have a, a purpose in it for the individual person, not just for the, you know, like, oh, we'll kill all these people, and so the world will will give up uh, the things that we're doing, mm -hmm. some ultimate reasons for the things. I think he has to have good purpose so visual. Yeah. Right. So let's analyze one sentence there. You said, I think God has to have some good purpose for those individuals. Yeah. 
And I think if we just analyze that sentence, I think I can mean that in a way where I agree with every single one of your words. I think it would be impossible for the existence of God to not have a good purpose for ordaining each of those things. To those, but, but they died. They right, and no so you're... For those right, and that's where I think... Benefit from their suffering in any way. Right. If there was any benefit. Does anybody ever benefit from their suffering in a way that's palatable to them beforehand? Nobody would. No. Right, so you're defining up front good for them by how much you see that it benefited them. No, I mean, what, what I'm saying is, like, things that have happened to me were mm -hmm. that have been suffering to me. Right. Later on, thinking about, I see something that I was taught or, yeah, there's or something about it. But what I'm saying is, for those people, mm -hmm. they didn't have that. They yeah. died. Mm -hmm. So, where is the benefit? There's a lot of things we don't know about what God is doing. Um, obviously, sort of in a bigger circle that we talked about, there's only two classes of people that relate to God. One, those who are trust in Christ, those who are His, and those who are not. And so, one part of the answer would be that, just while people are still living. There's people who will live another 50 years and will never as you say, benefit. In other words, they would never see um, God clear as a result of this. So death by itself doesn't introduce that problem. Um, everybody who's living is still in those two categories. And so I know it seems like it minimizes it, but the fact that they died doesn't really change two facts. One, that we don't know whether or not how many of those people were saved and who wasn't. Um, and we don't know, we don't have enough information of what God was doing uh, with them beforehand or in relation to other people. So it's just a matter of sort of defining our terms. And I was, it's the hardest part of almost any other academic discussion because here it's not academic. Um, and so that distracts us from the fact that it still is a matter of truth. I mean, if what you're saying is true, then its opposite is false, and what you're saying is true, even though it's something that causes tears and is and legitimately. And, and stuff like that, but that, that doesn't change the fact that all those other things we said are still true. Um, so it's one of those things that we have to trust God for. We don't have another choice there. <laughs> well, it's, God does have all the answers, but, but he doesn't, that, that doesn't mean he has to tell us. Because I think it's important not to confuse what we know with what, with what God knows, obviously. The first thing I would do is I would hope that they stated it exactly as you did, because they just used a magic word, exclude. They're assuming up front something which I would say you should not assume, and that is that the more God is glorified, the less significant my life is. Or the, I mean, what all are you assuming in that uh, sort of a dichotomy? And again, I used that example before about plants and photosynthesis. If you like a plant complaining to the sun that it's just, everything you ever do is shine all the time. Everything you ever do is always, you know, the sun, sun, sun. And 24 hours a day, that would make no sense because a plant was designed to live on the sunlight. And in the same way, in the biblical worldview, man was made as an image of God to enjoy God. Our, our minds were made to think about God. Our feelings were made to feel about God. And our wills were made to make decisions to sacrifice other things so that more people could see God 
and his greatness. And so everything you call good, beautiful, happy in life was his idea. He did that. And we abuse those things. And we are the ones that cause evil and cause that exclusion where God's glory is at war with our happiness. When in Christ, that's put back together. And the greater God's glory is, the more we see God in the gospel, in his son Jesus, the more our happiness and that doesn't happen overnight. As you become a Christian, you see more and more of how that is uh, throughout your life. Part of that is suffering. Suffering is part of that tearing away of those idols and those things that would get in between us. And we'd just like to announce that Matt will be back on October 30th. Same place, same time. ILC 118 at 7 o'clock to do a talk on the law of the law. Yeah, so the law above the law, I kind of, I robbed that title from a guy named John Warwick Montgomery. Um, basically, the idea is, think of the Nuremberg trials, the Allied powers, what they had to argue against the Nazi war criminals um, that were being tried, or um, ones that were being tried. They had to make an argument that uh, German law, American law, they're not just two relativistic things. You have to have, in order for anything in government, in law, in society to function, it kind of dovetails tonight very nicely. You have to have a, a law, a, something written on the conscience, whereby you have access to justice, to these eternal standards of right and wrong, that become the stuff that make government just, which, again, another oxymoron, but the way God designed it, uh, we'll start to see that you can't actually have a just law without there being something that comes through natural law, namely God's law. So... I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight, and if you would like to stick around for an informal question and answer time, yep. be here until they do this out. So have a great night. <laughs>